Wow. <laughs> my name is Linda Leukas. Um, Heini and, and Nippe already introduced me pretty well. I'm an illustrator, author, programmer, many things, but I'm also a recovering startup activist, and I'll tell you a little story about that in a second. I co-founded Railscouts, which has been in 227 cities all over the world uh, in the four years of its existence, and this is me in 2009 in the Slush main stage, pitching Alto Entrepreneurship Society. And I had a trembling voice, and on this side of my head, I had this, all these ideas about Hacker News and DDoSing and, and Series A's and growth hacking. And on this other side of my head, I had these ideas about bunnies and rainbows and social sciences and policy making. And this is the thing with us humans. We are not binary. We are not one thing or the other thing. We contain multitudes. So this is what my story is going to be about. Um, I lived in New York for a few years, and when I moved back, I still held this, like all of the biggest startup principles, very dear to my heart, namely those of changing the world. But I started to think about, actually, like where does the most scalable change happen? What is the biggest point in our lives when, when things matter to us and, and stay with us? And ladies and gentlemen, that happens when you're four years old. That's the most scalable change in life we have. And since then, my kind of passion and life has been about technology, uh, combining imagination and technology, passion and play, and all of these things. And I spent last summer researching this, thinking of ways how to make programming more accessible to more people and how to make it more playful and fun. And I came up with three principles of play that I'm going to show to you today. And I'm going to show some concrete examples of how Ruby's world folds out. And uh, let me see. And there's a website involved. So if you get excited about any of these exercises, helloruby.com is today open. And you can see all of the exercises over there. You can print them out. You can deal with them with your neighborhood kid uh, or your own kid. And you can see what other kids had built. Uh, but my story, actually, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. This is the thing that scares me the most, that there's going to be a world where there's people who build things and do things and do amazing things, the crowd we have here at Slash, and then there's going to be the other half of the people who are stuck, who just uh, use their object of uh, things that they have nowadays. And my sort of fear is that even though we all agree that software is the most important and inventive way to like, change the society at the moment, we don't necessarily need more grammar lessons. We need poetry classes. So I'm going to jump into my three principles of play. But before that, I want you to go on a journey with me. So this story requires you to take the blue pill, just like Alice in Wonderland, and fall deep, deep, deep into the machines. So principle number one is a principle of playfulness. It's a question of what ifs and when ordinary becomes extraordinary. On fifth grade, we all get screen names. Mine is Hyper and my best friend is Leo86. And we log into this kids' chat room and we copy paste these sassy one-liners from Spice Girls songs and we feel so powerful. And then my dad finds out that I've given our family email address to a stranger and that stranger has emailed us and he's absolutely furious. But I'm secretly exhilarated. There's a world outside. And I bet many of you in the audience had the experience as a child that your, your childhood was pretty isolated. When you went on summer vacation, you had no idea what your friends were doing because there was no Facebook. You were stuck on your summer cabin. And I think at 28, I'm one of the first generations that has had the experience of roaming around internet. So when I was a teenager, I would start the day as being Sabe Sunrider, the Jedi Knight who saved the world. And I would learn about makeup tutorials on Demi Pistefian, and I would learn to set up a server. And it would be this time of very exhilarating journeys, and the home button would be sort of the leech that would bring me back to safety. And I feel like those experiences of being very free, open-ended, internet roaming were the ones that brought me to this little girl. Her name is Ruby. Uh, she's absolutely fearless, uh, a little bit bossy, and knows that you're not supposed to, supposed to be afraid of the bugs under your bed, and that sometimes big problems are just tiny, tiny problems stuck together. And she's the one who actually introduced me to the colorfulness of the computing culture that is sometimes so neatly hidden under the murky internet forums. Uh, so Ruby has a lot of friends. Uh, she has the friend called Snow Leopard. Uh, she's, she's sort of like alone. She loves beautiful things, but doesn't want to play with the other kids. There's robots who are absolutely messy, but very friendly. There's the book smart penguin and uh, the, the idealistic fox. 
And Ruby is kind of my perception of the world of technology, the way I learned to see it. And the thing is, little girls, they don't know that they are not supposed to like computers. They, they are very perceptive and precise. They have a lot of ability to concentrate on things and tell stories and explore things. And they don't know that they are not supposed to like computers. You know who does? The parents. The parents think that programming is this weird, esoteric world, very scientific, almost close to com uh, quantita uh, quantum physics uh, in relation to how applicable it is to the real world. And the parents and teachers, they teach the kids about how combustion engines work and how to get to be a uh, space astronaut uh, or um, how the human body works. But when your kid comes to you and asks, hey, what actually happens when I press play button on YouTube? Or, or what is a bubble sorting algorithm? Or, or Linda, Linda, is internet a place? We grow oddly silent. We mutter something about magic and about it being very complicated. Well, it's neither. It's not magic and it's not complicated. It just all happened really, really fast. The computer scientists of the past have done the most amazing things in the world where they've built layers and layers of abstraction on top of computers and made them tinier and tinier to the point where we, the normal consumers, don't know anymore what computers are and how they function. So the first thing in Hello Ruby's principles of play is to build your own computer. And we do this with kids and we assemble our paper computer and we learn about the bossy CPU and the helpful RAM and so on and so on. And the most important thing we do is we design a web application. Uh, I've had some really imaginative kids. First, they come up with the usual suspects. They make Angry Birds, they make Clash of Clans, they make games. But after a little while, things start to get interesting. So I've had this little girl, a future dolphin doctor, uh, who designed a dolphin healthcare application droid. Uh, she was six years old at the time. And then I've had this little boy whose favorite, favorite thing in the world was to play with his father. The father is the astronaut, and he's the mission control man. And he's designed on his little computer an intergalactic planetary uh, space agency uh, application. And his role, very serious, with his headphones on, uh, is to guide the father, the lone astronaut, safely home from the other side of the room, from Martian orbits back home. And those kids are going to have a profoundly different relationship with technology uh, going forward. So principle of play number two is that of curiosity. It holds the question, why? It's about exploration, finding different hidden things, and imagination. And this story some of you might have already heard, but it's a good story, so I'm going to tell it. It starts with a girl and a boy and a burning teenage love. So I'm 13 years old, and I have this humongous crush on Al Gore, who was the vice president of the United States. And this was 2001, and I was not cool at all. So everyone else loves Legolas, Orlando Bloom, and Leonardo DiCaprio, and I'm in love with this older man. And at some point, the scrapbooks are not enough. Like, uh, assembling the pictures is not enough anymore. I need to... <laughs> make something bigger. So I make a website for him in Finnish, the first and last website for Algar in Finnish. This is 2001, so there is no Tumblr, there is no Facebook, there is no Pinterest, and I need to learn PHP, CSS, HTML, all of these things, how to set up my own server in order to express the world how much I love Algar. And I love it. It's absolutely amazing. But then there's other boys. There's other things to get excited about, like um, philosophy and art and, and all of these things. And I run into this binary problem again. On the other side, there's the people who build things, the mathematicians, the scientists. And then on the other high side is the whole rest of the humanity, the people who are colorful and happy. And I want to be on this side. And I wish people would have told me at the time that for a girl who loved Bernard Russell's uh, philosophy, I loved reading philosophy, I, I enjoyed conjugating French irregular verbs. Those are exactly the same kinds of muscles that do make sense when building mobile applications or when doing uh, programming. And that the very DNA of internet is humanity. Internet is built on the generosity of people. And there's, uh, there's so many examples of the way technology is not a foreign binary thing. It's, it's about people. So computer as a word used to mean a person who computes well. Technology in Greek meant also the tools, not only the tools, but also the technicalities and competencies and skills to make that thing happen. So the Greek felt that agriculture is technology, that democracy is technology. And we've somehow lost all of that. 
I think the thing that we can give with our, for our kids by teaching them programming, by teaching them computational thinking, by teaching them to understand technology, is that we give them things to think with, not think about. And those things will stick with them for a long time to go. Uh, one of the exercises we do with the kids is uh, one of, um, of computers. And I show them these four key, uh, pictures. I show them a picture of a car and a toilet and a grocery store and a dog and ask which one of these is a computer. And most of the kids sort of replicate their parents' perception and say, like, none of this is a computer. And then we start to have a discussion. And the discussion goes like this. Ah, actually, there is a lot of computers in a, in a car. There's a navigation system. And in Japan, I've heard that the toilets do have a computer. And maybe a dog isn't a computer, but the collarbone might have, or the collar might have a computer inside of it. And you know what? When your parents were little, the computers couldn't fit on this stage. But probably when you're going to be grown-ups, the computers are going to fit inside of every single milk bottle out there. And that's when you start to see how the kids' imagination is light enough, and they are like, whoa, this is really exciting. And the other thing is, imagine if your little girls next Halloween dress up as Ida Lovelace's, make their Ada Lovelace was the first programmer of the world, living in the Victorian era with flowers on her head. She was the daughter of a poet and a mathematician, and she was the world's first programmer. And we speak about these role models, and we speak about the history of computing. So third principle of play uh, is that of rules, asking the question, how? Imposing a logic on something otherwise very hard to understand. And the story for me goes like this. So after the whole Al Gore extravaganza, I felt that this technology stuff is pretty cool. I, I need to try it further. And I signed up for AP Java classes. And the first assignment over there uh, was to draw a teddy bear uh, with like Java, which those of you uh, who have used Java know that it's not a very sort of easy thing to, or it's an easy thing to do, but not very nice. You need to like define all of the little points and so forth. And I complained to the teacher that this is absolutely ridiculous. I draw a way better teddy bear with my bear their hands, or even with Photoshop. And the thing that the teacher failed to mention is that for one teddy bear, sure, Photoshop and uh, drawing by hand is great. But if you want to draw like a hundred teddy bears, or if you want to make teddy bears that go from small to very big, or if you want to make teddy bears that go from every single color uh, from the rainbow, that's when computers are really, really helpful. And this brings us to the beauty of technology, the scale. So with one solution, or one line of code, or one, one invention, you can solve problems of thousands of people, of tens of thousands of people, of six billion people. And the beauty of this is that in the next 14, no, next six years, so by 2020, there's going to be one billion more mobile users, people who have mobile phone as their supercomputer in their, uh, in their pants or, or skirts. And it's just a massive, massive market of opportunities for people to build solutions. And those solutions don't exist today because there is no market for these things. And I think we've heard so much about platforms over here, but we need different kinds of people to build these solutions. Haney and Nippe already told the story of the Kickstarter campaign. I think what's important to underline here is that this wouldn't have been possible in any other era than today. This is an era where we can self-teach, we can open source, and we can crowdfund. And imagine if I had gone to a Finnish publisher and told them that I have this idea about a children's book that I want to make, and it's going to be about a girl and, and like these creatures and so forth and so forth, and they would have been like, oh, Linda, there is no market for this. And they would have probably been absolutely right. And had I gone to a VC and told them that I have this idea about a, uh, a multi-channel uh, children's brand about computing, the VCs would have said, like, mm, no, no profit in this. And they would have been also right. But this is the era where we can actually build our own audience. We can handpick the people who help us out, and we can have the whole world as our marketplace. So my ending is probably this. You guys have been here in the North for a few days. Uh, you've enjoyed our saunas, our uh, weird uh, <laughs> after parties, our fairy tale cities. And I'll let you in on a secret. Scandinavian people are the happiest when they build things. They, it's not a coincidence that the 
like backbone that most of the world's open, well, not most, but a big chunk of the world's open source software is built here in Scandinavia. You have MySQL, which is Finnish, Swedish. You have PHP, which is Danish, Rails, uh, Linux, Git, SSH, IRC, all of these technologies that embrace the biggest startup platitude there is, uh, the idea of changing the world, but in a little bit of a different way. So instead of changing the world, we change the world for everyone. Instead of looking for local maxims, uh, small, uh, tiny like problems of, of our own, we look for these big solutions. And my thing that I fear the most currently is that we are still going to be, be like sp split into two groups. Those people who have the energy and attitude and ideas and tools to build the things that they want to do, and then those who don't. And it's a weird thing, no one is born a maker, no one is born intrinsically curious about how things work and how they should be poked and how they should be opened and twisted and made into better. It's something that you can actually teach to people. And my sort of hope and fear, uh, hope is that we learn this relationship with technology. We don't think that it's a walled garden of, of things that we can't touch, but we actually learn to look at it, make it better and make it better for everyone. So wrapping up, playful, curious, and rules. These were kind of the three big principles of play that I came up with in relation to Ruby's world. But also because I've noticed that there's not that many young females on this stage. And there's not that many young females in the audience either, which is a huge pity. I wanted to sort of recap this whole session from my own experience. So playfulness, first of all. Everything that is big in life starts as a toy. When the mainframe came out, people felt it was a toy. When the PC came out, people felt it was a toy. When the mobile came out, they felt it was a toy. And there is absolutely no way where I could have foretold that when I was 13, I would have this crush that would lead me to uh, start Rails Girls at 23 and then lead me to raise uh, a ton of money for a children's book on computing. I couldn't have planned this. The only way to sort of live that for real is through play. Curiosity. I feel like a lot of people think that ideas sort of just turn out ready, resonating, and meaningful, like grown-ups. It's not the case. Ideas are really scrappy and, and, and horrible in the beginning. And when people ask me, like, how did you come over here where you are now? I, I always tell them that I learned drawing by drawing. I learned programming by programming. And the only thing that separates me from anyone else is that I just spent a ton of time on this. I, I probably spent more time thinking about this problem than most of the people in the world. And that's somehow a reassuring thought that, that you can just like hammer your way through. And then the final thing, uh, rules. Um, I think at least young women, or I, I had the problem that I was thinking about the step five when I should have been thinking about the step one. And Kind of programming helped me to see that there is this intrinsic logic in everything. And the only thing you need to do is take the first step. And then you worry about the next step. And then you worry about the next step. But if you worry about steps five, six, and seven in advance, not going to take you very far. When I was a kid, the thing I wanted to do most in the world when I grow up was to be a world builder. So. I lived a lot in my head, and, and I would wake up in the Tatooines in the morning and, and have these like uh, crazy rides across Narnia and, and fall asleep in Moomin Valley. And, and nobody told me that you can't really actually graduate to become a world builder. But I found a loophole through technology and through uh, working in startups. You can actually do this. Programming, the act of creating something out of nothing with the pure power of words, actually gives you the possibility to build whole worlds and become a world builder. And that's pretty neat. Thank you.